Hi guys, it's Blackie. Okay, we're going to talk about campfire for a minute because we're going to talk about some thermal dynamics and what's going on in a campfire because there seems to be a misunderstanding sometimes about the dynamic of a campfire that burns more than just a few minutes. Okay, so let's talk about how the campfire itself works. Okay, first off we've got ground level okay the most common thing we want to do when we get out there is we want to dig a fire pit okay now a fire pit of course is simply a depression cut in the ground usually fairly shallow many of the people that talk about leave no trace this is one of their things dig the pit etc that can open you up to some problems depending on where you are. Now, not so much down here in the south, but let's look at the ground for just a minute. If we have saturation of water down here, where it's been raining for a couple of weeks, and right now it's dry, but for the last several weeks, or whatever, that water table is fairly close, by opening up this hole into the ground, I am deepening it, that means I'm exposing water to the bottom of the pot fire. I build my campfire up in here, and it doesn't want to work right. Well, one of the things I've done, I've opened it up to that moisture, and heat of the fire turns the water to steam. Steam causes heat loss to the fire, which causes the fire to smoke, which causes the fire to want to go out. So wet ground causes the fire to want to grow out. We'll get to that in a minute about how we're going to defeat that. But let's say this isn't water, it's just good dry ground. Or worse yet, what if we have peat or loam down here? And what that is, that's a layer of buried leaf matter, buried whatever down there that has become compressed, and it's basically something that'll burn. I was at a uh, living history event many years ago that it was reclaimed land. Well, what they didn't tell us was it was a reclaimed coal mine where they'd been surfacing off because this vein of coal was very close to the surface. And so whenever you dug down about a foot, you hit coal. You couldn't dig a hole and build a fire because once it gets in that coal, it's gonna burn out. There's enough oxygen there. This might burn for years. So quickly we had to run around and tell people, you don't build a, a hole, you have to rake up dirt. But the dirt structure that we're going to build our fire on, fire on can greatly affect the performance of the fire. If it's wet, we're going to generate steam, which is going to mean a lot of acrid smoke and hard to get it going. The bigger and more powerful we try to make the fire, the more steam comes up. And this is gonna go on for several hours till we finally dry the dirt out enough that it doesn't have this effect. But a hole has its own effect. Now let's look at that for just a second. When you have ground level, the hole, ground level, and then I build up my fire in here. Okay. That's in a hole. The air current coming to it does this. No, very little air is going into the hole. What does that do? It smothers the fire. Now you don't see this in a quick fire. Something's going to burn maybe 30, 40 minutes or an hour. You do see that in that all night fire. And you've seen this. You'll get a good big bed of coals going, I mean a big bed. And you'll throw a log up there and it'll burn about two or three minutes and it'll be flames and the flames go out. It's burning, but there ain't no flames. You got rid of the oxygen. There is so much of a heat column going up, it's sucking there and no oxygen is coming in. So the actual combustion area is being starved for oxygen. Its own success is defeating it. 
it's sucking that heat up so fast there's no available oxygen for combustion it's a smoldering combustion at best and you know that because you surf it around you get flames from it and the flames just go away there's lots of heat but I don't get no flame flame indicates gases are being released and they're combusting there's no flames you just got the heat okay you don't have enough oxygen no flames no oxygen okay that's a simple rule So, for the leave no trace guys, I would humbly submit this. There is, a, in my mind, a better way to do it. You've got the ground level. Instead of digging a hole, scrape up dirt and make a mound of dirt and then build your fire on top of that. You're elevated. And so, air is drawn up to it from ground level. This doesn't smother. An elevated fire is getting oxygen. Plus, if you make the woods very chaotic and open where you get plenty of draft, you're in a better situation to suck in and therefore get the oxygen you need. So, an elevated fire does better. Plus, when I'm done, all I gotta do is take this sand or whatever, and broadcast it. Make sure there's no coals or embers in it. But I can then just simply sling it out all over the place. And the dirt underneath it doesn't have a burn pit. Uh, we used to go to a state park years ago to do a reenactment. And they wouldn't let you build fires on the surface. So what I did was I brought a uh, sheet of concrete, square piece of concrete, a big paver stone, and I put down and I, I poured two buckets of regular old playground sand on top of it, and I built my fire. When I'm done, I made sure there was nothing left. I scooped up any unburnt wood into the bucket with the sand, broadcasted what was left of the sand, and picked up the paper. Kicked the grass. You couldn't even tell I'd been there. It was a way of preserving the ground with leaving no trace. And so that's one way you can do it. So an elevated fire is my preferred fire, actually, if I'm trying to leave no trace. I will scrape up, get rid of the leaf debris, and simply scrape up dirt to form a, you know, hula hoop sized circle of one or two, three inch high, mounted up dirt, and build my fire on top of it. When done, broadcast it, little or no evidence. Now, a fire that's in a hole can smother. A fire that's up high gets air. Also, I'm controlling the water barrier here because I'm above the water table even more. Now, what if, and you already know this, we're going to go over it anyway. What if you've got ground level and down in here, you know you got a water table or I got some peat or I got buried leaf litter where, you know, it's come a flash flood or something and it's got sand up here on top but I go down a couple inches and I start hitting a lot of leaves I don't want to dig down there's a good chance if I do that I run the risk of starting a fire that's going to wick its way underground it might emerge somewhere else days or weeks or even possibly months after I've left and cause a forest fire so I want to avoid that so I need to come up with some way other than making a mound I'm going to pile up firewood fairly close together main fuel something about like that I'm gonna pack them in there tight I might even drive a stake or two in the ground on either side of just broken off sticks to keep it from rolling apart then going across the grain up here like a log cabin I'm gonna put a few more sticks on top of this is what I will then build my fire and let it burn down okay by doing this I'm elevating it up I'm getting airflow and I'm not allowing that wet ground or suspect ground to have an opportunity this is going to be a relatively short fire overnight if everything goes the way it should go I should not burn all the way through my, my base logs because they're smothered they're up tight against each other and they'll burn on the top but they can't get enough air to go down. So it's acting like a wick. It's burning slowly, okay? 
as my coals and all this ash form in here on top of it, that smothers it down. Now in the morning when I get done, it looks out. Those logs are suspect because they, and what we're coming to the next point, they've been banked. Okay? Let's talk, in, let's talk now about an old world skill of banking a fire. All right. Banking a fire means to take coals and put them in the bank for the rest of the night to have coals in the morning, okay? I can do this with just about any fire lay. So we're gonna start with just a standard, as I just said a minute ago, a mound fire lay like this. Here's my firewoods up here on fire, here's my flames, and this is my mound of dirt. It's been burning a couple hours, it's getting late in the night, and I'm getting ready to go to bed, okay? I'm gonna select out here a couple of pieces of char. And these are well-burned wood. It's that wood that's normally on the edge of the fire that's thoroughly burned, it's blackened. You know, it's got coals in it. You fan it, it'll do up, but you pull it away from the fire and it dies down. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It's obviously fully burnt. Okay, I'm gonna rake it into the fire's edge good, make sure it's fully on flames, and that when I pull it out of the fire, it goes out like that. That tells me the surface gas has been born. It's one big hunk of char. It is, in essence, char cloth, okay? I'm now gonna rake it over here to the side of the mound, and I'm going to bury it with a little bit of dirt and put one or two big pieces of wood on top of it. I'm not going to completely bury it. I do want a little air hole, but I want to put it on top and over it in this section right here. I'm wanting to deprive it of oxygen because I want it to smolder very slowly. I'm creating what we were talking about, that coal and that wicking fire in a micro. By doing that, that wood will keep cooking all night. Now, as the main fire up here goes out, and I go to bed. During the hours, this keeps cooking. This is in the bank. Now in the morning, I come out, I put me some fresh kindling up here, a few more pieces, I pull out a big wad of my dry tinder that I've kept in my haversack or I've put up under my tarp or I've gathered and secured some way so in the morning I got dry tinder, no matter what. And I can come up here, uncover this, rake those hot coals into my bundle of tinder and blow it, whoosh, poof, stick it into the fire. Stick it into my tinder bundle and away we go. I have kept a fire going for 12 days in a row without ever having to relight it. As far as never had to strike another match, no more flint and steel. I just kept it going. The fire would appear to be out, there's no smoke, but I had banked coals. Mike Denny and I and I with a group were at uh, uh, Georgia Bushcraft a year or so ago. And we came back and the fire had been out eight hours. You know, it's now dark. We hadn't had this was the breakfast fire. And came back and he said, "We're gonna have to start from scratch." I said, "No, I bank coals." And I pulled out a water tender. I set my thing and I took my hat and I fanned the the uh, ash and the soot off where I had put those coals. And there were about four coals about the size of that glowing. I scooped them up, fanned it, had flames, and stuck it in yonder we went. Didn't have to start from scratch. I banked the fire. So, in conclusion, the dynamic of a campfire when you're making a short-term fire, quick fire, you know, just heat up some coffee, heat up the quick chow. Those fires are like you see everywhere. Everybody builds those, you know how to build them. Short duration. The transition to the long duration of a campfire that's gonna be here two or three days. That fire, we start banking. We do things differently. Elevated is better because we're gonna generate that big bed of nice hot glowing coals because we're gonna be cooking. And I need to have coals I can shovel out and put on the Dutch ovens or whatever. 
but that fire is harder to get flames because it's starving for oxygen. Like I said, there's no airflow in. I want it elevated, or otherwise I'm just gonna have big old glowing coal with no flame, no light. Flames transmit heat better. Coals hold the heat, but flame transmit it. When you're sitting around a fire and it's cold temperatures, and you got a nice big glowing bed of coals, you don't feel heat very far away. When you got four foot of flames, you see heat. You feel heat a lot farther away. That flaming radiates heat in the distance better than the coals radiate heat, okay? You wanna cook on coals, you want flames to boil water and to radiate light and heat, okay? And finally, the last little tab that we're gonna go over You've got a fire. Let me redraw this one second. You have slightly elevated. You've got a big bed of coals right here. Firewood, flames. Well, this has been going on for four or five days. You're not gonna get this advantage till you've been there at least three days. This has been a fire you've kept going. It's been the, the cooking fire at night. It's been the, the, the one we set up late with. It's been the big bonfire at night when we're talking. You've heated up the ground. The ground underneath here has now become nice and hot, okay? If we're gonna be here a week, a trick that I learned to do was I'll dig a Dakota hole underneath the fire pit. Like that. And that Dakota hole will be like that big around, big enough I could run down there with a pair of tongs or something and put a small pot in, okay? This hole will become hot enough to bake bread after three or four days, depending on the conditions. All I gotta do is have a plug to put over the end. It's an in-ground oven now. And after we do a two-week camp out, after about definitely, yeah, three days, definitely after four or five, we'd have the ground oven going. And we're baking bread, we're baking sweets, we're using it like a slow cooker. We're putting the meat into the pot, we're putting, the, putting it up on the fire, bringing it up to a hard rolling boil, we'll let it boil for a good 30, 40 minutes. And then we're sealing it up and we're putting it down there and we're putting the cap over the top and we're building up the fire and we're leaving. That's gonna act like a slow cooker because that heat's gonna keep radiating down. We done brought the temperature of the food up above boiling. So it's act like insulation, it's dead hot air around it. And we have been gone eight hours doing other things and come back and open up and pull out a Dutch oven from such a hole and it be fully cooked, roast or whatever. Just because it's cooking slow over time at a given heat. But you're not going to get this advantage unless you're keeping a fire going that long. And whenever you get done, and that's another thing on the safety side, we are now done. We're about to go home. We use this for the morning coffee. That fire's been going four, four, four or five days. You better bring several buckets of water because there's nothing up here on fire. There's no smoke. We've let it all burn down. It's just a few little gibbets there and it's ash. That ground right there is at several hundred degrees. Don't believe me? Walk up and pour a canteen cup worth of water and I'll watch steam shoot straight up. That ground is hot enough to bake, so you need to protect it. If there's any risk of a fire in the ground, start pouring water on it. If, like I have said, I'm in questionable ground and I've made an elevated mound because I don't want the debris in the ground to burn or the peat or the coal or whatever's there. I'm gonna move that fire. I'm gonna run in that kind of condition no more than 24 hours in one position and I'll move the fire maybe five or 10 feet away. But I'm gonna move that fire to keep this saturating heating from happening and causing a problem in that ground. Hope this gives you some ideas guys. Please leave any questions or comments below. Until next time, I'm Blackie wishing you safe journeys. Have a great day, guys.